Welcome to part two of Airplane Flight Control Surfaces and High Lift Devices video lecture. Moving on with flaps and slats. The flaps, they allow the lift and the drag to be increased. So they're very optimal on the takeoff and landing procedures of an airplane. Uh, slats allow the wing to exceed its maximum critical angle for which without would cause the wing to stall. What the slats do is the leading edge of the slat will actually direct airflow underneath the slat and direct it over the top of the wing. This allows for higher wing angles to be made when at lower speeds, preventing a wing stall. At the maximum usage of wing angle and slats, the wing lift can be increased by as much as 60% with wing slats. But first we should start with the flaps. This is a standard hinge flap on a Cessna 172. There isn't much slotting going on here for airflow to bypass. However, the requirement to bypass some kinetic airflow over the flap is not as required on such a light airplane. So this is the basic hinged flap on general aviation airplanes. Now this graphic here represents the slat and flap configuration on heavy airliners. As you can see, the takeoff flaps are moderate and should this wing angle exceed its maximum critical angle, then airflow will actually meet the leading edge of the slat and then flow underneath the slat over the wing. So if we increase the angle to 30 degrees, let's say, this leading edge slat would be in line with the airflow, and instead of passing it over the top of the slat, it will pass it underneath it over the wing. So the idea is to keep the airflow flowing over the top of the wing faster or optimal than compared to the bottom without that the wing will not fly anymore. So if we were to remove the slat and go to a high critical angle the airflow will not be able to make it over the top of the wing and then the stall will occur. But with the slat during level flight the airflow is dominant over the top of the slat as if it is the leading edge of the wing. But when the angle increases airflow will then flow underneath the slot I'm sorry, the slat, and then flow through a slot over the top of the wing. So on uh, takeoff, when the airplane is lightly loaded, the flaps are not as required because they will create too much drag. When an airplane goes airborne and it's too light, it won't have the dynamic momentum to overcome the drag. So ironically, when an airplane is lightly loaded, they'll tend to fly them faster on the runway to get enough dynamic momentum to overcome the drag, but when the uh, airplane is heavily loaded, which is usually the case because they're trying to make money here to pack as, uh, as much uh, passengers on board and luggage, uh, you'll see the flaps being moderate to full, and then the airplane will get off the ground at a shorter runway roll, but with a lot of drag. The reason why that happens is because the dynamic momentum is much greater when the mass is increased or the payload of the airplane. So a lot of times the uh, takeoff roll is optimal and then the flaps are moderate. Of course you always have the slats deployed, but a landing you got to break all that uh, momentum, all that high airspeed and high payload. So during the uh, initial to final landing procedures you'll see the flaps go pretty much the full deployment and of course you have slots to catch some bypass some of that kinetic airflow and turn these into telescoping wings a little bit and that aids in the amount of efficiency that the flaps can provide between lift and drag so you're optimizing the lift and you're optimizing the drag with the slot 
So the idea is to break the uh, speed through drag, but then also increase the lift. So then it's a safe uh, landing taking place because you have as much lift compensated as for drag. And then if you increase the critical angle on the final landing flare, you have the slat as a backup safety mechanism to pump the air underneath the slat over the top of the wing. So this is all very important to prevent a potential wing stall when on final approach at lower speeds. Here is a fixed slat on a ultralight short takeoff and landing airplane. And of course this is not going to be stowed away. This is a permanent fixed flap. And this is something that could get this ultralight off the ground in under 50 feet of roll because after they clear, uh, clear the tail from any tail strikes, they will, the pilot in this case will increase the angle to a severe extreme angle and without these slats the wing would stall but because if this wing was at let's say 35 degree angle the slat would kick in and pump the air underneath it over the top of the wing and this would increase the lift by as much as 60 percent greater than it would without the slat but the only drawback is is that this airplane obviously is limited in speed because all this drag that builds up you have your dynamic pressure that builds up on the front of the slat and then it accelerates over business as usual just like it's a normal wing but if it were to exceed its maximum critical angle then this leading edge slat would be farther up here and then the air would pump underneath it over the wing keeping the plane airborne here's a double slotted flap on the Boeing 727 in its full deployment probably on maintenance procedures here you notice the slots also bypass some of the airflow and turn these into telescoping wings a bit to maximize their lift but then there's also enough of a dynamic pressure that builds up to turn these double slotted flaps into enough drag to slow the plane down and also enough lift to keep it airborne so the lift to the drag is balanced and stabilized the slots uh, conserve the kinetic flow and turn these into lifting structures as well as these being uh, drag structures as well Here is the uh, slats and flaps deployed on the Airbus A300 on uh, maintenance procedures. Here are the different types of flap systems and designs. These planes slotted and split are more common on general aviation and Utility, uh, utility aircraft. Uh, the Zap Fowler also can be found in utility and some uh, corporate jets. And then the double slotted flap is uh, dominant on the airliners, heavy airliners. And then this design here is the standard technique for uh, high lift structures on heavy airliners. The double slotted flap with lead, leading edge slat. Here's a spoiler system at its full deployment into speed brakes. When the main carriage uh, makes touchdown on an airliner, uh, the weight on the landing gear trips the squat switch, which then turns the uh, spoilers into full deployed speed brakes. And then uh, this causes the wing to no longer lift, and it turns the airplane into a land vehicle, and then the pilot can then bring the nose wheel down uh, by alleviating the elevator uh, deflection to its downward state. And then when the nose wheel makes contact, uh, then the thrust reverser can be engaged, which is a thrust redirecting, a thrust 
redirecting system, which will push some thrust forward against the high rate of oncoming airflow and quickly break the momentum of the airplane. The brakes cannot be used on initial touchdown because the wheels are so small compared to the airliner that pretty much the brakes would burn up. So you got to first break all that uh, dynamic momentum through the spoilers into speed brakes and then the thrust reverser and only when uh, you have a slow enough speed most likely below 50 knots then you can start to use the brakes a lot of times pilots will just roll that plane in and let its kinetic energy dissipate until they're going very slow under 20 knots and then use the brakes a little bit to make the turn to into the taxiway then to the concourse These are the vortex generators, the fins that are positioned so that they make uh, convergent ducts to each other. These increase the airflow and the eddy current vortices on the top of the wing. When you increase the airflow and the eddy currents that you see here, you're going to cause the lift to increase using these vortex generators. The only consideration is that if you have a drag sensitive application where drag is uh, very critical, you may not want to use the vortex generators, but almost all heavy airliners, you'll see a few VGs, vortex generators, and uh, you know they will increase the mass and then decrease the velocity at the trailing edge part of the vortex generators, but then they create eddy currents, so all, all in all the turbulent flow is actually higher and then the overall mass and the flow is higher and this causes an increase in lift but based off how small and lightweight the VGs are that's a single vortex generation generator component they're very efficient for the amount of lift they produce compared to the weight of the component Okay, now winglets, uh, airplanes without wingtip winglets, they will have a little issue here. The pressure on the bottom of the wing is greater than the pressure on the top of the wing. So when the wing runs out at the wingtip, the high pressure airflow will slip off around the underside of the wingtip and turn into wake turbulence. There will be these vortexes that develop. So if a uh, non-winglet airliner flies through smoke, you can always see these little vortexes behind the airplane's uh, wingtip area. And those are the, that is the high pressure air spilling off the wingtip around and they turn into wake turbulence. Now if you put a winglet here, what happens, this high pressure that spills off is then redirected into a linear flow and actually increases the thrust a little bit. Also, the high speed airflow at the wing tip upper surface is also guarded for any weight turbulence that spills off and interferes with the flow. And you have to remember that wing tips are very, very critical. The amount of lift at the tip is going to create much more of an effect to the airplane because the wings are like levers. So the wing tips, when they're protected or when they're implemented with uh, winglets, they are going to actually have uh, a greater lift efficiency and you can reduce the stall speed a little bit because of the winglet. Also because you get added thrust, you're also going to get a little bit better fuel economy. So uh, the standard winglet design today are the blended winglets that have kind of a curvature that allows continuity from the wing to the winglet and uh, some of the older uh, winglets were just 90 degree or basically degreed perpendicular fits to the wingtips but uh, winglets are somewhat high lift devices because they're on the wingtips and for the amount of lift that occurs on the tips it's going to transfer exponentially to the plane so they could be considered uh, secondary high lift 
devices. Here's an example of a winglet, and Boeing likes to use the winglet, whereas Airbus, they like to use the wing fence. Now the wing fence has its advantages because the airflow at the leading edge wing tip corner will actually go around a contoured rounded edge and then the oncoming airflow will push that wake turbulence over the upper wing fence structure and act like a winglet but then the lower speed high pressure air on the bottom of the trailing edge of the wing tip will then also be prevented from spilling off and having the upper structure of the wing fence direct it linear instead it happens right at the interval of the lower structure so this may have somewhat higher efficiencies and also that it's using less material compared to a winglet however the drawbacks could include more wingtip flutter and the advantages also aside from doing what a winglet does on both ends is that there is a little bit more yaw stability so all in all depending how a winglet or a wing fence are designed they are basically equal and they have their pros and cons but they're balanced out as a stalemate in function so the one thing to make note of is that the Airbus company uses the wing fence whereas the Boeing company uses the winglet so right away if you see a wing fence that is absolutely an Airbus the last two are the servo tab and the anti servo tab uh, this is applicable mainly to light general aviation aircraft that do not use hydraulics to amplify force to the control surfaces so assume that this is a horizontal stabilizer and this is an elevator and the pilot is using non-hydraulic cables and it's all human strength to pull back and forth on the yoke to move the elevator with the servo tab the trailing edge part of the elevator flight control surface will actually have a hinge system that will move up and down. Two functions of the servo tab are such that it can be set up so that if the pilot wants to gain more force amplification to move the elevator upward, the servo tab would go downward because it creates an uplift. Also, this can be trimmed a little bit downward to keep the elevator a little bit upward in case they have to trim the airplane and go hands off. And also the opposite is true. If they have to point the nose down a little bit, like on a Cessna, the elevator may need to be down a little bit, so then the servo tab could be moved a, a tad bit up to create a down moment. On pipers, they tend to want to be trimmed elevator upward because the eddy currents are a little different behind the low wing. And on the Cessna, the high wing causes a different set of eddy currents. And uh, the inherent uh, flight characteristics is the climb. So on a Cessna, you may want to have a, a servo tab in the up position to create a elevator down, to keep the nose pointed down a little bit and then the pilot can fly hands off on the Cessna and the exact opposite is true on the Piper because it's a low wing. Then lastly we have here the anti-servo tab and this is very common on the Piper Cherokee instead of having a fixed horizontal stabilizer with a moving elevator the entire horizontal stabilizer will move this is called a stabilator and you'll notice that if the pilot wants to increase the climb 
course the stabilator only moves up a few degrees, but then the anti-servo tab will also move up in the same direction as the stabilator in order to make the counter force on the input increase because you don't want this stabilator to flutter or have too much input especially at high speed because then you won't really have a controlled climb it will be a jerking violent up climb or down descent so this anti servo tab basically moves in the same direction as the stabilator in order to make the input force harder or in, or in order to make the input control a lot tighter making it harder to move which is the idea so this comes to the end of this lecture these are the basic high lift devices and airplane flight control surfaces video lecture thanks for watching this video and have a great day